Chapter 2. Where do your troubles come from? Probably the most puzzling and distressing of all human problems is the problem of evil and sin. What is this false affirmer that prevents us from realizing the power of good in our lives? What is this sorcery that overlays our perfection with imperfection, our health with sickness, our supply with limitation, our fortune with misfortune, our peace with discord, and our happiness with misery? What is this devil that bedevils us, this witch that bewitches us, the sin which besets us, and this satanic power which confuses us? Why is it that when I would do good, I do evil? And what is this evil that seems to challenge the very presence and power of God? Where did all this chaos, confusion, and trouble come from? If God is all and is good, then how can evil exist? If God is power and omnipresent, how can evil have more power than good? How can an all-wise, all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful, and ever-present deity be set in opposition to itself? If God is perfect, and if we are made in His image and likeness, how does all this imperfection get into our lives? The answer to these questions are all found in the story of the temptation and fall of man in the Garden of Eden. To understand the lesson in this story, you must first understand the meaning of the symbols back of it. The garden represents the highest state of spiritual perfection, wholeness, and completion, called in the Bible the kingdom of heaven. The plants in the garden represent man's thoughts and ideas. The two trees growing in the center represent the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They are placed in the center of the garden because man's life and consciousness are not only built around them, but are fixed by them. They form the center from which all human experiences spring. Eve represents the soul or consciousness. Adam symbolizes the physical body. Adam means red clay, the soma or earth principle. Before Adam and Eve fell, ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and divided their thought, they lived in a state of absolute perfection. After they fell, they were cast into a state of separation, which in the Bible is a consciousness or knowledge of good and evil. The deception that brings all trouble into our lives is an inverted and perverted sense of life. It is an abuse of the creative faculty of thought. Why did man fall? If you will think of the Garden of Eden as symbolic of the soul and of the man and woman as symbolic of the mind and body, you will see that the fall referred to is an ever-occurring experience in the life of man. The characters in this drama are a husband and a wife, Adam and Eve, and a tempter, designated as a serpent. The scene is a lush garden in the Nile Valley, and the props are two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The plot is concerned with the man and his wife, who are so inextricably bound together that when the woman is tempted and falls, the husband falls with her. There is nothing in the story to indicate that the husband was tempted, but he went down just the same. One wonders as he reads this story if Moses ever got the inner meaning of it over to his people. Cleverly, he closed his words in symbol. If they obeyed the symbols, he knew they would get the same results if they understood the law back of them. The story of Adam and Eve is a convincing picture of the reciprocal action between the mind and body. The body is but a mirror of the mind. Body and mind are two ends of the same thing, man. They act and react reciprocally, never independently. What affects the mind affects the body. What the mind does, the body does with it. If the mind is tempted, the body is tempted. If the mind falls, the body falls. Where does the serpent come in? The serpent is the carnal mind, the belief in evil. It represents the thought turned down towards sense or experience. It causes man to judge according to appearance and from purely fleshly or human standards. The serpent says, cancer is incurable. This is impossible or that is insurmountable, despite the fact that the words are proved false every day. The great curse before which man falls is the belief in duality, the knowledge of good and evil. This belief in separation from God is the source of all our grief, woes, and illnesses. Had Adam and Eve, body and mind, not broken the law, then harmony in which our souls were created would never have been disturbed. Why did trouble come to you? Let us consider now the why of evil. Why did evil come into your life, and why is it perpetuated from day to day? You say that you never consciously thought of the particular difficulty from which you suffer. Well, perhaps not. But unwittingly you did think the things which brought the difficulty upon you. Since all thinking is set in motion through wrong thinking, it could have come to you in but one of two ways, through your failure to comply with divine principle or through ignorance. You attracted evil because you were subject to it, because you believed in it. It was the result of your belief in something apart from or greater than God, or conversely, your ignorance of the one God. Most errors imply lack. Ignorance is a lack of knowledge of truth. Confusion indicates a lack of harmony. Discord indicates a lack of peace. Sickness indicates a lack of health. Poverty indicates a lack of supply. And disorder indicates a lack of unity. 
You can readily see that your troubles come upon you through the double power doctrine and double vision. Instead of seeing with the single eye of Christ, you have seen with the double vision of the carnal mind. Thinking outside the principle of truth, you have seen two powers instead of one, good and evil, two substances instead of one, spirit and matter, two conditions instead of one, heaven and hell. The carnal conception of things is thus formed, and you begin to move out from wholeness into separation and adulteration. Believing that evil, as well as good, has a self-originating cause, you come into the conscience of both good and evil, and trouble enters your life. In other words, you open a new window into your soul and create a new affinity. Where before there was only one window open to God, you now have another window open to evil. The first guest is life-giving. The second guest is death-dealing. The first builds, the second destroys. Consciousness of good causes you to see things right side up in relation to the law of God. Consciousness of evil makes you see things upside down in their relation to the law of sin and death. The fall of man is repeated every time you accept the false testimony of the carnal mind and allow it to control and dominate you. When the window is closed to evil, it will stop coming into your life. To the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. To the forward, thou wilt show thyself forward. How did your trouble come? When we realize that we and we alone are responsible for all the evil that enters our life, we shall stop blaming God or others for our ills, troubles, failures, sorrow, and unhappiness. Evil comes to us in just one way and operates in just one way through suggestion, acceptance, and belief. In the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy we read, The Lord shall cause thy enemies to rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face, for they shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Most of us are aware of evil only after it has taken possession of us. Very few know how it comes. When the method it uses is perceived, however, the problem of handling it and overcoming it will be simple. Let us approach the problem with this thought in mind. Evil comes to us as suggestion and operates through our belief. Evil is not person, place, or thing. It is an impersonal thought operating through our consciousness. The belief in evil is the only evil there is. If we accept the suggestion of evil, react positively to a negative. It moves into our consciousness and begins to express itself in our lives. It has an affinity, so to speak, for other evils, and it will permeate, contaminate, and discolor our entire experience if allowed to remain. If, on the other hand, we refuse to accept the suggestion of evil, refuse to respond to it, entertain it, or give it power, it will die for lack of recognition or attention. But evil, no matter how hideous its form, is powerless unless we furnish it a belief or body to act through. It comes to us for power, substance, and life, and we give it all the power, substance, and life that it has. No matter what form the particular suggestion of evil may take, fear, worry, hate, resentment, doubt, sickness, or poverty, it cannot live without a mind and body to act through. It dies by inanition. It falls by its own weight. If we do not give brains, faculty, emotion, and physical organs to evil to act with, it will disappear and let us alone. In other words, evil cannot come to us unless we accept it. Being nothing and being recognized as such, it can do nothing. We render it powerless when we recognize and declare its nothingness. What can you do about trouble? Since the human or carnal mind is filled with many impurities, it is incapable of thinking straight or according to truth. It thinks from the standpoint of evil, weakness, and lack, instead of from the standpoint of good, power, and plenty. St. Paul said, The carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. To be carnally minded is death, having things in reverse, sickness, discord, poverty, failure, and lack. So to be spiritually minded is life and peace, health, harmony, plenty, success. In order to overcome evil, we must learn to reverse our thoughts and to think from the standpoint of the Christ mind instead of from that of the human mind. The usual approach to the solution of personal difficulty is by the labored and frantic activity of the human mind. The true method is by the unlabored and involuntary motion of the Christ mind. Meeting defeat in one direction, the human mind turns in another. But no matter how or where it turns, there is no solution or escape. Why not? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. In spite of this revelation, man goes on trying to gain dominion over evil with a mind that is basically evil. It doesn't make any difference what a mind thinks or what he strives to do. If he acts from the standpoint of personality, he is calling the human mind into action and increasing his trouble. The true way to overcome evil and trouble is to turn entirely away from appearance, still the mind, and establish oneself in the mind of Christ with this thought. Because all God's wisdom is mine. 
I am now directed and guided in all my affairs, and I am delivered out of my troubles. Then keep the mind quietly centered in God. Make no effort to solve or change the problem by the wisdom and methods of the human mind. If we let that mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, it will dispose of trouble by giving us something good in its place. It will give us spiritual life instead of material life. It will give us peace instead of discord. It will give us health instead of sickness. It will establish us in the kingdom of God. What is the cause of sickness? Power belongeth unto God. Psalm 62.11 The only reason anyone ever becomes sick is that he thinks of himself as two beings and two bodies instead of one. When Jesus said, Physician, heal thyself. He was not talking to those who were still in the fleshly consciousness, but to those who were in spiritual consciousness, to those who represented the perfect unity between God and man. In the old forms of religion we had the same problem, God and man, God and devil, good and evil, heaven and hell, health and sickness, life and death. There were always two instead of one, always God and something else. Out of this warfare between opposites have come all the suffering, ill, and limitation of man. Jesus did not say, I and the Father are two, or four, or six, but I and the Father are one. I am. You are. That is enough. Just as the principle of mathematics is always one with its numerals, you and I are one with the principle or truth of God. Did not St. Paul tell us that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory? What did he mean? He meant that when we have unified ourselves with God, knowing no other, and giving power to no other, we shall also appear in glory, for we shall see ourselves as we are in reality perfect. In other words, we shall think of ourselves not as a material body subject to sin, sickness, and death, but as the perfect body of God. This is the truth that Jesus said would enable us to overcome conditions and transcend the world. Again, St. Paul said, You are the wisdom, knowledge, and power of God. Let us start to claim this power by acting out our unity with God. The only reason a poultice or shot in the arm works more quickly and effectively than a metaphysical treatment is that material remedies are more real to our consciousness than spiritual treatments. In the fleshy mind, it is much easier to believe in matter than in spirit. But in either case, the essential elements are belief and faith. All healing is based on our recognition of the power of God. A pill or a poultice is a step in this direction. Let us be satisfied until we see ourselves differently to demonstrate what we are.